You know, it's hard to believe that it's been just about a year since I stood right here and said something like this. During the course of this campaign, we're gonna give money that in many cases we don't even have to people that in many cases we haven't even met yet for a God that we love very much. And over the last 12 months, that's exactly what's happened. We've seen God bring in more than $2 million for these campaign goals. And with that money, we've been able to expand the kingdom right here in the capital region, but also around the world through our ministry relationships. On October the 26th of last year, we broke ground on the Half Moon expansion. God answered our prayers and the project has moved along safely and quickly ahead of schedule. We look forward to the year ahead and the day we'll actually be able to use this amazing 8,000 square feet addition for ministry. We were able to help fund important local projects like the beautiful new kitchen and dining room renovation at Joseph House in Troy. And today we're excited to be able to write our first check to World Vision to help aid in refugee relief in Lebanon. We caught up with our Saratoga pastor, Mike Adams, to talk about what this moment means to him personally. By far, one of the most impactful parts of my trip last year was getting a chance to visit one of the refugee camps right there in Lebanon. I sat in a shack with a woman from Syria. She wore a key around her neck to the front door of her home. She and her children fled Syria for Lebanon after she witnessed her husband murder. She wears that key around her neck with the hope that she can return home one day. Stories like hers are played out hundreds of times over in the camps that I visited. Conditions that are unfathomable to us are their everyday reality. A world vision intentionally and creatively shares the good news of Jesus by being the hands and feet of the gospel right there in Lebanon. Part of what I saw over there was a school that World Vision established for the youngest victims of this crisis. The school is there to give them a hope and a real chance in their life. There are also programs bringing clean water technology to these camps that desperately need it. The things that we take for granted are the things that they pray for. And finally, World Vision is directly helping local pastors who are there bringing the gospel to the people that are right there. It's an overwhelming feeling to know that our church is playing a part in this solution. Being able to contribute this way means real life change to the people most affected by this crisis. <laughs> For the mother I met, it means her children will have clean drinking water and an education and just maybe it gives her the hope of getting home safe and sound. It also means that there will be a local church ready to love them every step of the way. Thanks, Pastor Mike, for sharing that. This is just the beginning. Along with the humanitarian aid projects, we're trusting God to see not only the completion of the Half Moon expansion, but the beginnings of the Latham renovations over the course of this next year. Drawings for the KC Hallway in Latham are approved and we're looking to begin construction this summer. On top of that, we're working with our kingdom partners in India and Uganda to provide the life-giving gift of clean water to villages there. All of these things were made possible through God's grace and through the generosity of this church. But you know, it's not too late. It's not too late to get on board with what God is doing with Grace Fellowship in this 2020 Vision campaign. And if you haven't made a campaign pledge as an individual or as a family, you can do that today. Simply visit the display in the lobby, fill out a pledge card, then drop it off at the Information Center or in the offering basket in the coming weeks. Wow, it's been an amazing 12 months, and we're looking forward to everything God will do in the next year of 2020 Vision. Well, this past uh, Valentine's Day, our nation was stunned and we were reeling from the news 
that came from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and yet uh, another school shooting. There were 17 killed, 14 injured. And there's all kinds of stories uh, that come out of this. Uh, among the victims is one heroic football coach who is being lauded rightly as a hero because he literally used his body to shield students from bu bullets. And then, there, of course, there's the geography teacher who was shot while locking the door to his classroom. But in doing so, he saved the lives of those students inside the room. And there were students killed as young as 14 and some a bit older who were in their last year ready to graduate and then to start college this fall. I think we need to continue in our own prayers for those families that have been so impacted by this as they try to put their lives back together and try to honor those who are dead, those who were loved so dearly. But have you ever wondered this? Have you ever wondered how do people go through stressful situations without some companionship, some belief in a higher power? How do they go through gripping anxiety and scary situations without some ultimate hope that if they were to die that they would be in the presence of God. Well, We come to a section today in Luke's gospel chapter 7 where we're going to see over the next few weeks a number of encounters Jesus had with people who were in desperate situations and he helped them. He proved to be a compassionate, caring friend to these people. And I don't know where you may be on your life journey today, but I do know this, whether you're a longtime believer in Christ or whether you're just kind of checking all of this out and wondering if it's for you, I believe before you leave today, God has a word he wants to speak to your heart and soul. So if you have ears to hear, I believe God wants to say something to you today, something that will not only be powerful, but life-changing. So let's jump in and get started. First, I want you to see the request that this centurion made. I'm going to start reading here in chapter 7, verse 1. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There was a centurion's servant there a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. Now I want you to consider several factors about this Roman leader that are quite unusual. First, he was an influential man. If you know anything about the etymology of the word centurion, maybe you've studied a little Latin or Greek in your background, you know it literally means leader of a hundred. So this centurion was in the Roman army and he led a hundred men. Some believe it might have been a bit more because often these bands went beyond the actual number given. So one of the commentators I read this week said he was a man among men. He was a mover, a shaker, an influencer in this culture. And I find it interesting when you study the New Testament, Roman centurions are always spoken of in a positive light. Isn't that intriguing to you? I mean, there's the centurion at the cross, for instance, who while others were scoffing at Christ, he made the bold declaration, this is the Son of God. Wow. And then in Acts chapter 10, we read about Cornelius, who was a God-fearing man and was the first convert to Christianity among the Gentiles. His name was Cornelius, a Roman centurion. And then at least two times in Paul's ministry, we read about Roman centurions who actually save his life. And then here's another one in today's passage. 
a respected man admired by the Jews for his generosity to them. We read on in verse 4. It says, when they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this. Now, let me just pause there for a moment. I'd love to go off here, but I just want to make one footnote observation. I know that's what they said about him, that he deserves it. But he did not deserve it. In fact, can I tell you that none of us, none of us deserve anything positive from God. It doesn't matter how much good he's done. It doesn't matter whether he built their synagogue or not or, you know, how loving he is of others. He does not deserve anything positive from God. And by the way, we're later going to see that he himself understands that quite well. In fact, he's later going to say, I'm not even worthy for you to come under my roof. He got it, but I hope that we get it. In fact, if we think we're deserving, we don't understand grace at all. Grace, by its very definition, means that we're getting favor from God that is unmerited. If it were merited, it would not be grace. That's what grace is, getting something good from God that we don't deserve. But they said, he deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. He was indeed an influential man. But second, he was also a compassionate man. Now, servitude in this century was a brutal reality. But here's a man who actually cares for this servant as a fellow human being. And he's willing to do whatever he can, go to great trouble in order to restore the man's health. That shows that he had a compassionate heart. Third, the centurion was also a humble man. And I find this particularly impressive in light of his stature in the Roman army. Verse 6 reads, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Now think of how rare that attitude is. The Romans are top dogs. They're in charge. They're the most powerful empire in the world at the time. And yet, this Roman leader says of a poor Jewish rabbi, I don't even deserve to have you come under my roof. That is rare indeed. And by the way, I think that humility itself is a greatly undervalued virtue in our culture. No doubt you've heard this week of the passing of Billy Graham, uh, this renowned, legendary evangelist who's preached the gospel to more people than anyone in history. He passed away at the age of 99 this past Wednesday. And uh, it's been all over the news, and I'm sure just about everyone has, has heard of it. And many of you have memories, no doubt, of Billy Graham, especially if you're maybe 40 years old or older. You probably remember a telecast on TV and seeing his name a lot more often. The last decade or two, he's not been in the news quite as much. But as many of you know, Dr. Graham's life and ministry had a huge impact on me. I met my wife, Debbie, while working for the Billy Graham team in the Syracuse area. The whole trajectory of my life has been changed because of this man. I still have in my office today a box. It's the original box when as a 13-year-old back in the 70s, I ordered some sermons from Billy Graham, little pamphlets. And they were condensed messages from his Hour of Decision broadcast. And those were the first sermons that I ever read in my life. I still got them, little pamphlets. And that was my first sense of how a person might preach. And again, it shaped my life. Well, he passed away Wednesday. On Thursday, Debbie and I received an invitation 
to attend his private funeral this coming Friday at noon down in Charlotte. And we're excited and humbled to be able to go to that. It's going to be a, a moment in time I'm sure we'll never forget. There will be presidents and former presidents, prime ministers and world leaders there, an evangelical who's who, basically, along with the extensive Graham family members. And I look forward, I'm sure it'll be a nostalgic time, I look forward to just meeting old friends again and former ministry colleagues that I spent years working with uh, during that time that I was with the team. And if you've listened this week to the broadcast on TV, you know of some of the things that God did through Billy's life. What you may not know is that he came to national prominence in 1949 in the Canvas Cathedral Crusade in Los Angeles. Scheduled for three weeks, but it was extended to six weeks because of the incredible things God was doing. So many people were getting saved. And it was during that six-week crusade that Billy's name became nationally known, the Canvas Cathedral Crusade. I think it's brilliant that a decision has been made to have his funeral in a Canvas Cathedral. Isn't that cool? Started that way, going out that way, and it shows something about the humility. To me, the single most impressive thing about Billy Graham is his humility. It never went to his head. He continued to see himself as a sinner in need of God's grace, and he was truly amazed, amazed that God would use a person like him to actually make a difference. Can I tell you something? Faith begins with the humble admission, I am a broken sinner, and I need God's grace in my life. Have you ever done that? Have you ever come to that point in your life where you recognize I'm separated from God by my sin and I need his forgiveness, that's where genuine faith starts. Jesus once sat a little child on his lap and he looked at those around and he said, unless you humble yourself and become like this little child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's where true faith begins. This centurion had a childlike humility that attracted Jesus. But there's one final characteristic I want you to see about him, and that is he was a believing man. Evidently, he had heard stories about Jesus healing people, and he believed them. He believed that Jesus, this miracle worker that he had probably never met, he believed that he could actually help his servant friend. We read in verse 7, that's why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. He's saying, Jesus, I know a little bit about authority myself, but I recognize that your authority is far greater than mine. Look, Lord, don't even put yourself out. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. Folks, I'm going to tell you, any way you slice it, that is remarkable faith. And so we've seen not only the request of the centurion, but now I want us to briefly consider the response of Jesus to this request. Verse 9. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Let me tell you something that I am intrigued by in Scripture. There's only two occasions where the Gospels say that Jesus was amazed, just two. One of them is right here. He's amazed at the great faith of the centurion. But do you know where the other one is? It's recorded in Mark chapter 6 when Jesus was in Nazareth, his hometown, 
And it says there, and I quote, he was amazed at their lack of faith. You see the extreme. One, he's amazed at the great faith. Second, he's amazed at the lack of faith. Now question, when God looks at you today, how does he feel about your level of faith? When the Lord zeroes in on what's going on in your life today, is he amazed? Maybe at your great faith, or is he kind of astounded and amazed by the lack of faith that's there? I want to tell you something you'll learn if you scour Scripture, both Old and New Testament. Faith is an essential ingredient in a relationship with God. Abraham is kind of the poster child for this. Abraham had all kinds of flaws and foibles in his life. He was far from perfect. But Abraham is lauded as a great example because of his faith. He actually believed that God would make good on his word. He believed that whatever God promised, he would make good on. And that kind of faith is what makes a friendship with Christ. The Lord's friends, are you one of them? The Lord's friends are those people who believe like Abraham and who believe like this Roman centurion that whatever the Lord says, he's going to do, and they act accordingly. So Jesus responded to this man's faith, in this case, with a healing And verse 10 simply reads, Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Wow. Immediate healing, even from a distance. I like what Psalm 107 says. It says of God, He sent forth His word, And healed them. He rescued them from the grave. And that's what happened here. Do you know that God is a God of miracles? Who can do things that mystify us and make us marvel? Now I'll admit that there's a number of things that we marvel at perhaps today. Or or we, we just rather kind of think it's really cool, and we may even start taking it for granted, but people a hundred years ago would have found it mystifying and miraculous. For instance, you drive up to your home. You're in your car. You punch a little button in your car. What happened? Garage door goes up. (laughs) It's just something you've done hundreds of times. You do it every day. You think nothing of it, but a hundred years ago, people would have gone, wow, that's amazing. Or you take a little plastic card. Out of your wallet, purse, you put it in a machine, you punch a few buttons, and $20 bills roll out. (laughs) Ha! Wow! People 100 years ago would have gone, oh man, that is incredible, that's mystifying. Or you can be on the other side of the planet, thousands of miles from home, and you can see a gorgeous sunset and pull your phone out all excitedly and go, i got to capture this. And you can do a video of that gorgeous sunset. And then with a text, you can send that video to your friends thousands of miles away. And it all happens in seconds. hundred years ago, people have said, that's a miracle. Today, it's just normal. But I want you to know, folks that there are all kinds of things that we just take for granted that we cannot explain. I can't explain the technology behind that or the way it happens. And God does lots of things in this world that we can't explain and don't understand, but one day we will. Roger Chambers was a popular professor at a Christian college and he I chuckle at this statement he said in heaven there's going to be a lot of people walking around with flat foreheads flat foreheads in heaven what do you mean he said yeah they're going to be walking around going ah now I understand now I understand and there's lots of things that we can't explain now but we will understand then 
I don't know how Jesus did it, but I know that he did. And I believe he knows all things that are going on in your life today. He understands them all. And he stands here today ready to meet you at the point of your greatest need. But all of that happens with a faith interaction with Christ. So as we go down home stretch today and then wrap up, I want to share in closing these four quick lessons that I hope we can take away. And here's the deal. Wherever you are, whether you're a long-time seasoned follower or whether you're brand new and just kind of getting started in this whole thing, I believe you're going to get something out of this. The first one, faith is believing what you cannot see and cannot prove. It doesn't mean there's no evidence. It doesn't mean there isn't some good reasons to believe. In fact, usually there are. The evidence is usually pretty strong. But it means that you cannot prove it. I like the way the writer of Hebrews puts it. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Centurion had never seen Jesus heal and certainly had not seen him heal from a distance, but he believed that he could do it and he put his confidence in Christ. Now when you think about it, there's all kinds of things that we as Christians believe that we cannot unequivocally prove and we perhaps haven't seen with our eyes. For instance, let's just go there for a moment. We believe, and we ask other people to believe this. We believe there's an almighty, omnipotent God that created this world from the most magnificent stars out there to the tiniest particles you can see only with a microscope, and he created it ex nihilo, out of nothing. We believe that even though we haven't seen it with our eyes, and we cannot see this God. Wow. Wow. We believe that even though we have broken God's standards as sinful people, that God did something about this. What did he do? He came in the form of a human, veiled in flesh, and died an atoning death on the cross so that your sins and mine could be forgiven. And we ask people to believe that. What's more, we believe that this same Jesus, three days after being buried, rose from the grave. And we believe that he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, even though we did not see that with our eyes, any of it. And we ask other people to believe that too. And we believe that he now offers to you and to me Forgiveness of sins, if by faith we will trust in what he did for us at the cross. And all of our sins can be forgiven. We can be adopted into his family. And he literally, miracle, he'll literally come in us by his spirit and begin to change us from the inside out. That is what we believe and we ask others to believe. Now listen to me, friend. Are you listening? We're either nuts we're either downright crazy or those things are supernaturally true. But make no mistake, faith involves believing what you cannot see many times and what you cannot prove. Second, faith does require a personal choice. Now, some of you may want to push back when you hear that and go, whoa, time out, pastor. I believe that faith is a gift from God. I would agree with you. I believe that too. I believe faith is a gift from God. The very faith to believe, I believe, comes from God. But you know what I also believe? I believe that while God gives that gift of faith, I believe you have to exercise a choice and you have to choose to put that faith in action, you have to make a choice to believe. Faith is choice, folks. And some people, can you believe it, choose not to believe. Happens all the time. 
Acts chapter 19 makes this clear. But some of them, it says, became obstinate. They, catch the wording here, this is a very willful word that's used in Greek. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way that is the early Christian movement. You say, now, Pastor, I don't get it. Why would anybody refuse to believe? I think one major reason is pride. I think you've got to admit that the good news of the gospel begins with some pretty bad news that doesn't stroke our pride very much. What is that bad news of the good news? The bad news of the good news is that we're sinners... And we can't save ourselves. That's not very good news, is it? But that's the way the good news starts, with some pretty bad news. That we're broken and we cannot fix ourselves, no matter how hard we try. And it takes humility to accept that. God doesn't save proud people. He doesn't save strutters. But contrary to popular teaching... You do not have to commit intellectual suicide to become a believer. But hear me now, you do have to crucify your pride to become a believer. The gospel requires humility. But I think the second and more powerful reason that some people choose not to believe is simply moral rebellion. Of the hundreds, literally Hundreds of people I've talked to about faith through the years, some of them downright atheists or agnostics, skeptics of all different kinds, I would conclude that for most of them, there is a strong moral component in their choice not to believe. And it is a choice. It's a choice to believe. It's a choice not to believe. You have to choose. But I think there's a strong moral component often at work. What is that moral component? I realize that if I say I believe this, (laughs) logically I then become responsible to align my life with the implications of that. And that is a place that many are not willing to go. That's why scripture says, in his pride the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts there is no room for God. And no one put it better than Jesus when he said in John's gospel, this is the verdict, light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. So there is a personal choice involved in faith. I wonder, I wonder if God is nudging you today toward that personal choice. And you're right on the brink of a decision Maybe would, today would be the day God would nudge you over the edge of faith. Third, and if you are out there and you struggle sometimes with some serious doubts, I would ask you to listen closely to this statement. Faith is measured by degrees and it is, it is increased by action. Jesus said to the centurion, I have not seen such great faith. He's basically saying to the disciples, guys, this guy's got more faith than you. On another occasion, he chided his disciples for their lack of faith. And Jesus taught that if you've got faith like a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move, and it'll be cast into the sea. Now, here's what I believe about you. I believe some of you are people of great faith. Praise God. Maybe you've cultivated it through many years of following Christ. You've seen God do wonderful things. And to you, you are a convinced follower. Your faith is stoked. It's at a white hot level. And virtually nothing can impact that negatively. But let me tell you what I believe about many of you listening to me right now. Here's what I believe about you. I just believe this is true. I think you've got a percentage of faith, if you will, Maybe 20, 30, 40 percent, 50, 70. But you've also got a weird alchemy of doubt in there. That's what I think is going on. I think it's true many, many times with people who are kind of in the game, in the church, following Christ, seeking to know him better. I think there's a strange mixture of doubt 
with our faith. It reminds me of the story in Mark chapter 9, where the man comes to Jesus looking for help. He says, Lord, my son's possessed by a demon. And the demon throws him in the fire to burn him, or it throws him in deep water to drown him. Lord, if you can help us, please help. Do you, do you remember how Jesus responded? He said, if I can. All things are possible to those who believe. And then the man says, and here's the key, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Boy, that's us, isn't it? We can honestly look toward heaven and go, I do believe, but, but help my unbelief because I have some pretty serious doubts here. You say, now, Pastor Rex, if I'm one of those people, if I've got just a little bit of faith, how do I increase my faith? You act on it. You act on it. That's how you increase faith. You've got to sow the grain of mustard seed if it's going to grow. You've got to strengthen that weak muscle of faith. You've got to exercise it if it's going to be strengthened. If it's a pitch dark night and you're five miles from home in your automobile and you're sitting there, it doesn't matter how much you want your headlights to reach five miles all the way to your home and illuminate every step of the way, it's not going to happen. And if you wait there until you can see every part of the journey and have every question answered, you're never going to get home. No, your headlights, they reach out maybe 75 yards. So what do you have to do? You have to act on what you know. You have to start. And guess what? When you start, you make some progress, and then you get more light. You can see further ahead, and eventually you make it home. I'm concerned. I'm really concerned about some of you because I fear that you're sitting there going, one day I know God's going to zap me. It's going to be like a jolt of electricity. <laughs> and all of my questions will be answered and all of my doubts will be gone. I'm afraid you're never going to get home. You've got to act on the faith you have. You've got to put it into action. And then God will increase your faith and you'll get some more answers and your faith will grow. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Act on the faith that you have. And God will give you more. And there's one final lesson I want us to consider. That is that genuine faith is always rewarded by God, note this, in his time. In the story today, the Lord rewarded the centurion's faith with an immediate healing. And sometimes God does that miraculously. Philip Monholland was a young man who desperately wanted to sing. He wanted to be able to inspire people uh, with a, a great voice and, and serve the Lord and honor God that way. And he prayed and prayed. And even though he had no musical training, and even though he never really sung before, witnesses will testify, it's as though he were touched by God with an amazing voice, and his voice after that blessed many, many people. I heard about a young boy, little boy, who whistled real loudly one day in the church service right in the middle of the pastor's prayer. Everybody was quiet. Pastor was praying. And this kid just whistled real loud. His mother was horrified. She tried to stifle him there. But afterwards she said, Gary, what got into you? What possibly motivated you to do that? He said, Mom, I've been praying all week for God to teach me to whistle. And he just then did. <laughs> Can I tell you something? When you exercise faith in God... It doesn't always mean you'll get an immediate whistle or you'll get a miraculous ability to sing or that you'll get an immediate physical healing or your finances will immediately be wonderful or you'll have immediate marital bliss. I hope you're hearing this. But when you exercise faith in God, when you sow those seeds, God in his time will eventually bring 
positive harvest in your life. And don't you let anything block that blessing. Don't you let anything block that blessing. Sow those seeds of faith. Do what you know to do, and you will be rewarded. I know a woman I greatly respect. She lived in a bad, with a bad marriage for 30 years. <clears throat> if her husband was a believer, he was the most negative, crotchety man I've ever met in my life. Hard to even be around. She stuck with it. She stuck with it. She prayed for him. She persevered. She tried to keep a positive attitude. And folks, I tell you, miraculously, God has honored her persevering faith. And her husband was radically changed. They're active in one of our campuses today. They love each other, love the Lord. God has restored and greatly enhanced their relationship. I know a couple whose marriage came to a tragic end with divorce. But both of them came to faith in Christ after that and said, maybe we should consider getting remarried. We both know the Lord now, and hey, we realize this isn't going to be easy, and there's a lot of baggage here, and so on. But we want God to make our story a redemption story where he will get honor and glory. And this is certainly not always possible. But they dared to believe that God could do that, and he has. And they are happily married today again to each other and experiencing the wonderful fellowship of God's people and active in the church. I could go on and on with stories about how God rewards faith in his time. But let me ask you this question. Where is your faith being tested these days? And are you looking to Jesus to be a caring friend to you? I grew up in a little country church singing mostly hymns. And one of the hymns that we sang a lot and that I really enjoyed was one called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And many people love that hymn, but they don't know the story behind it. It was 1857. Joseph Scrivens was a young man engaged to be married to a beautiful young woman. They were excited about spending their lives together. And on the evening before their wedding, she drowned to death. He was naturally devastated. He left his home in Ireland and moved to Canada just to try to get away from everything that would bring him a memory of her. He was so distraught. But he was a Jesus follower. And he knew that his faith in God would need to be strong to get through this. But his mom, back in Ireland, was having some physical problems. And he wrote a loving letter to his mom. And inside of it, he included a little poem that he believed God had allowed him and inspired him to write. And it later became a favorite hymn of many of us. And I think particularly powerful in that little poem that he wrote, are these words. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you that we can take not only our weaknesses, but every bit of anxiety and concern we have to you in prayer. Thank you for how you meet us right where we are. Thank you today for the faith of a centurion that literally amazed you. It amazed you. May our faith amaze you as we learn more and more how to follow faithfully, how to sow seeds, how to act on the faith we have, and Lord, I pray that in your perfect time, you would reward that faith. In Jesus' name, amen.